Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Witcher, and I am the event producer here at the BIA. So welcome to our webinar this morning, titled AI Solutions for Earlier Disease Detection. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on YouTube from next week. So please feel free to send the link to your colleagues. We'll be taking questions at the end, so please use the questions box uh, on the side of your screen if you would like to ask any question at any point throughout the webinar. We will then address these questions at the end. So today we're very lucky to have our two speakers joining us today. We have Dr. Anthony Holmes, Director of Science and Technology at the NC3Rs, who will give a brief overview of the application of AI and maths to disease detection and the scientific benefits. I must also mention that it's International Women's Day today. So it is fitting that we have Dr. Manashi Nandi, Senior De Lecturer in Integrative Pharmacology at King's College London, presenting her model. She will go into detail about this application and present a case study of the model development. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Dr. Anthony Holmes to introduce the application of math to biology. Thanks very much, Alex, and good morning, everybody. So, yeah, so this morning I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of the application of maths into biology as an introduction to Manassi's talk. And I'll also highlight some of the efforts from the NC3Rs that we've made to try and support the easier integration of maths and biology to advance science and also to reduce our reliance on animal models. But before I get into that, I thought it'd be worthwhile, my computer would work, there we go. Um, worthwhile to just give you a quick introduction to the NC3Rs, because I'm sure a number of you on the line may not know who we are. So we are the National Centre for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals in Research. We're an independent scientific organisation established by the UK government in 2004. And essentially we work as a research funder, plus we have a number of in-house programmes which are led by our scientific research staff. We work across all the biosciences with industry, academia, regulators and funders, both nationally and internationally. And we have a broad remit which covers any area of animal use for research purposes across biology, um, medicine and veterinary practice. We have 30 staff based between our London head office, which is within the Wellcome Trust, and within our regional posts around the UK as well. And we have a budget of just over £10.5 million a year. And if you'd like to know more about the organisation, please do take a look at our website. Um, so we've developed a number of different mechanisms by which we can support the development of new tools and models and approaches uh, which reduce, replace or refine the use of animals and help support the scientific research base. We fund the next generation of research leaders through our uh, PhD studentships and our early career fellowships. We act as an honest broker, bringing together groups of scientists from academia and industry around specific problems to generate an evidence base to support changes in policy, practice and regulations and influence decision making. We have a number of resources by which we raise awareness of how the three R's can be applied and the benefits of this through our various websites and the events that we host, the guidance documents that we produce and the publications that come from the office and also from our researchers. Um, and the vast majority of what we do is about providing new models and tools and approaches for the research community. And we do this through our response mode grant funding schemes, but also through our Crack It Open Innovation platform, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later on in the talk. So why are we interested in maths and its application within biology? Well, Leonardo da Vinci said many, many years ago that no human investigation can be called real science if it cannot be demonstrated mathematically. So he was clearly ahead of his time. And the application of bio math to biology clearly isn't a new thing, but it's such a hot topic at the moment because we're in an era of really big data. Um, Technologies such as the omics of revolution, the use of, of uh, telemetry devices, means we can generate huge amounts of data and we're at risk of drowning in this data if we can't exploit it and interpret it properly. And it's because of these kinds of technologies and approaches that our biological knowledge is really expanding, but how this fits together it is less clear. And this is where maths can help because concurrently with the developments in biology, we're also seeing developments within mathematics, such as chaos theory to help understand complex nonlinear mechanisms in biology. We've seen an increase in computing power, which facilitates calculations and simulations that previously haven't been possible. And it's quick and safe to do and also three hours relevant. So for an example, in an era of mass air travel and new pandemic diseases, the work of mathematical modelers enables us to explore and evaluate strategies for containing or dealing with these situations that just wouldn't be possible in any other ways. And trial and error is too slow and potentially too lethal. And it's been summed up really nicely by uh, Joel Cohen, who's a mathematical biologist based in New York, in this paper in 2004, 
where he describes mathematics as biology's next microscope and biology as mathematics next physics, only better in both instances. And really what he's trying to get across here is that the microscope opened up a whole new microbial world that was too small to be seen uh, by the naked eye. And mathematics essentially does the same thing in opening up new understanding by providing a means to analyze and interpret data that previously wasn't attainable. And Manassi is going to give a really fantastic example of this uh, during her talk. But the key point here is that um, biology, math isn't just important to biology. Biology is also important to math. And we must realize that mathematicians are really, really crying out for opportunities to work with biologists so they can develop new mathematics and apply the mathematics they've got into new areas. So mathematical modeling and statistical models can provide us with a framework for synthesizing existing data and expert knowledge in a universal language which enables us to test hypotheses without the cost of traditional experimentation. Um, it enables us to highlight gaps in scientific understanding to direct future data generation, and we can use it to help predict and understand biology and risk assessment. But as with any model, it's important to understand and recognize that mathematical models, uh, you, you need to be able to accommodate the uncertainty, um, and that these models are imperfect representations of reality. So despite the advances that maths clearly offer, there's still a hurdle and barriers to the integration of maths and biology. And um, I've highlighted here just a few of them. There are many others, um, including funding, making sure the funding is specific uh, to the uh, problem itself, how we can provide opportunities for biologists and mathematicians to understand each other's language, and how do we define the biological problems in a way in which those mathematicians can understand and appreciate and ultimately understand how their knowledge and expertise can feed into helping solve those solutions. So for the last few slides, I'm just going to highlight a few of the examples that we uh, offer from the NC3Rs. Firstly, um, looking at how we define problems and fund solutions. The example I'm going to give is from our Crack It Challenges Open Innovation Platform. And this is essentially a milestone driven research funding competition where we work with large companies to define their business problems which involve the use of animals and affect their product development. And we then pitch those uh, challenges as a, as a problem statement to the academic and small company sector to see if they can come up with relevant solutions which we then fund the development of. And this can be funding up to the region of a million pounds per challenge. And the challenge that I'm just going to highlight very quickly is our in vitro to in vivo extrapolation challenge which was um, sponsored by Syngenta, AstraZeneca and Unilever. So it's a really lovely example of how different companies from different sectors still face the same kinds of challenges and problems and come, can come together in a pre-competitive environment to um, help try and identify some of those solutions that might exist. And the whole idea behind this challenge was to develop a model that provides understanding of the relevance of toxicity concentration data from human in vitro systems to predictions of safety following relevant in vivo human exposure. And the focus was on um, systemic toxicity rather than localized endpoints. And the whole point of this was to try and deliver new understanding of the exposure parameters in vitro and how these relate to safe human doses to enable us to do some of this preclinical work in, in more um, robust in vitro models than some of the animal models that are currently used. And this challenge was awarded to a consortium of um, biologists, mathematicians, statisticians, and chemists who were led by Dr. Steve Webb from, Webb from the Liverpool John Moores University. So his team included five universities and one small company. And what they were trying to replicate was the heterogeneity in the liver because hepatotoxicity is such a large problem in drug development and a critical cause of drug attrition. The problem being that the current preclinical models, both in vitro and animal models, don't predict what we see in the clinic. And so what they wanted to come up with was a new in vitro system that was um, more predictive of humans with a sufficient complexity to replicate the key parameters of the uh, in vivo liver sinusoid. So we're talking about zonation of the liver where different parts of the sinusoid have different oxygen, pH, uh, hormone gradients, and so on, as we can see here. So in the, the perivenous region closer to the central vein, um, we have different concentrations of oxygen and hormones to what we see within the periportal region. And this is, these are elements which are critical, but haven't been able to be uh, developed in in vitro models so far. So this is the kit that they developed. Um, it's essentially a number of hollow, fiber, uh, hollow fibers um, combined into a single bioreactor. Each of these hollow fibers is then lined with hepatic cells. Uh, and there's a series of outlets for enabling sampling, which allows real time analysis of the uh, metabolites which might be coming off. And because these are hollow fibers, it's possible to pump uh, fluid and test compounds. Oh, sorry. 
it's possible to pump fluids and test compounds through the lumen of these hollow fibers um, and down along the cells which line the lumens, enabling them to absorb the nutrients, oxygens, and compounds. So you're able to see gradients which are similar to those that you would see within the in vivo sinusoid. And all of this combines to provide a tool which will hopefully be more used to industry in determining which compounds are likely to be uh, liver toxicants much earlier in preclinical development and removing those compounds from, um, from the pipeline so they don't go into later animal regulatory testing, um, reducing the need for animals, but also the cost to the company. And the role of mathematics in this has really been critical to the development because it enables to help set up the system so that it best replicates the uh, liver sinusoid in terms of its physiology. So it's able to predict, to predict the optimal flow rates, fiber length, membrane thickness, cell seeding density. It also helped to interpret and quantify the results from the hollow fiber bioreactors and benchmark them against existing in vitro models and in vivo data. And it also enabled scale up of the results from the hollow fiber to understand the relevance of um, those, um, that data in a human context. And by applying the mass, they were able to speed up this, um, the model development by about three times what would have been possible if they had done this in a wet biology approach. And then the, the final couple of slides, I'm just gonna focus on an approach that we have applied to try and support biologists and mathematicians to come together to be able to understand the language a little bit better and come up with a common language. And this has um, been based on the math study group approach from the EPSRC. And so we've worked with the EPSRC, the Mathematics and Medicine Network and the Poems Network to host these study groups where we bring together mathematicians and academics and industrial researchers working within the life scientists and where the biologists present the problems that they are facing which they want to gauge the mathematicians on to see if they can help provide some of these solutions. And then the mathematicians brainstorm these. And this really focused approach very quickly leads to new insights to the research problems that can benefit science in three hours. And it's one of these um, study group case studies that Manassi is going to be talking about a little bit later on. So I'm not going to provide a case study for you, but I'll just highlight the process a little bit. And there's a link to our website where you can look at the problems that have been um, showcased in the past. So it starts with um, an open call for research problems from the biological community. Those that are selected then present those to the mathematicians and statisticians at a week-long study group where they are removed from their day jobs, if you like, and away from um, students, research commitments, so they can really focus on these problems that are being presented to them. The mathematicians then select which of the problems they want to work on, and they go off into separate rooms with the scientists, with the biologists, to really brainstorm um, what that might look like. And very quickly, they're able to turn those biological problems into mathematical language. And what's critical here is because the mathematicians and biologists are working together, that iteration has happened, is able to happen very quickly and each of those different communities are able to sort of bring each other along so they understand exactly where each is coming from. Also critically within the process, the groups get back together very frequently to give progress updates and so they can get input from other mathematicians that might not have been working on those problems. Um, and then at the end of the week long study group, they can apply for follow on funding to support a smaller meeting um, where they can get together, finalize the results, and put together their final publications, which are then uh, reports, which are then published on the um, various relevant websites, um, and start to develop ideas for where that grant funding might be. And this really is a, a fantastic approach to be able to um, drive those relationships between mathematicians and biologists, and it really has generated some exciting outputs. Um, and on that, I'll stop, but it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Manassi, who's a senior lecturer in integrative pharmacology at King's. And her research really focuses on cardiovascular regulation in disorders, including pulmonary hypertension and septic shock. And whilst the majority of her career has utilized animal models, in the last few years, she's transitioned to data sciences following her collaboration, which was started at our 2013 um, study group and today she's going to tell you about the new technology that she's developed as a result of this uh, which is called a tractor reconstruction and which can really extract new information from routinely collected signals such as blood pressure and has a potential application within drug development uh, clinicians and many other areas as well so Manassi over to you. Thank you very much Anthony um, and thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to speak it's a real pleasure to be here um, and I'm going to describe to you a, a new mathematical method that was developed at the NC3R workshop um, in conjunction with Professor Philip Aston who's a mathematician at the University of Surrey. What I'm going to show you today and hope to convince you is that it's really important to extract information about the shape and variability of cardiovascular waveforms what you can see on the screen now is my blood pressure data that's been replotted and visualized in a different way. And I hope to show you that by quantifying the features of this triangle or what we call an attractor, 
we can hopefully extract more information about what my cardiovascular system was doing at that time, and that may enhance the sensitivity of detecting changes in disease or in drug development, for example. So this is not a new science. We've known for a very long time that there's information in the shape of physiological waveforms, such as the pulse waveform. This is a study from 1874 by Frederick Mohamed, and I'll uh, direct you to the, the slide on the right. And this shows an individual woman um, during pregnancy in the first stages of labor and postpartum. And you can see that the shape of her pulse waveform is changing considerably. But in 1874, this could only be described in a qualitative manner. Now in 2019, we're actually fortunate enough that we have the numbers that make up all of the points of that waveform. A typical hospital monitoring device will capture data at about 125 hertz to 250. And in the preclinical context in research, we're looking at 500 to 1000 hertz. On the right here, we've got data collected in just one second from a mouse using radio telemetry. And this is, of course, too many data points for me or anyone to handle as a, as a biologist. So what we do is we ask our machines to give us averages of things like the maximum, the minimum, the amplitude, the rates, et cetera, all of those values that we know and love, such as systolic pressure and heart rate. But by doing so, by taking these averages, you're missing all of the rest of the information. So all of the information about the shape of the waveform in between is being missed and it's being discarded. Now, scientists and doctors who I've spoken to say, yeah, we can see changes in these waveforms, but at the moment they're described qualitatively and we need to have a robust method to quantify those changes. So what is this technology? Well, it's a mathematical method that can process waveforms such as blood pressure and ECG. The important point is that it uses all of the numerical values. It doesn't take these averages of particular areas. It looks at it uses every single data point. And it also doesn't rely on the identification of specific features. So it makes no assumption about the wave. It's just taking the numerical values that make the wave. So for example, when we analyze ECG, it's not looking for a QRS peak. And importantly, it doesn't just generate an image, but it also provides a method of quantifying the shape and the variability of the input waveform. So looking at the cardiovascular system, pretty much everyone on the on the line has probably had their blood pressure measured by a cuff and that measurement will have been taken close to the heart on the upper arm um, and typically you will have reported a systolic and a diastolic pressure which are a sort of set point pressures but of course that's a composite of many different regulatory systems within the body such as the renin angiotensin system the autonomic nervous system local mediators all of those come together to give us this measurement. And this measurement is telling us what the body is doing at that time to maintain a cardiac output to ensure blood perfusion is appropriate to our organs. The problem is if something goes subtly wrong in a, in an, a region that's remote from the heart, so for example, the gut microcirculation, it won't necessarily be picked up here. And what I'm hoping to show you today is that you can have a body system that looks apparently stable when you look at the measure of blood pressure, but actually it's a system that's failing. And if we can detect early failure sooner, then we're much more likely to be able to treat it. And this is an example of early failure that you can see in sepsis. Now, sepsis is an example I'm going to use, but it's not the only application of this method. This is real data, but I'm going to use it illustratively. We've got blood pressure on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and this is about a seven hour long experiment. In the beginning here, this, this is an animal under terminal anesthesia, and this is the baseline blood pressure at the beginning. Then we give an inflammatory um, uh, endotoxin agent and we give some fluid, so we're just inducing an inflammatory response. And for the first few hours, the animal remains fairly stable. And this can be likened to a, a plane that's starting to fail, but it's maintaining altitude. Then what happens is the system effectively crashes. So all of those control systems just fail and the system goes into precipitous fall of blood pressure. And that can be likened to a plane falling out of the sky. Now, if we were to just look at the systolic and diastolic pressure and use those as our readouts to diagnose a patient, we might be treating the patient at this stage when we see that there's an appreciable fall in maximum and minimum. But actually what we should be doing is trying to work out if we can see impending deterioration. 
In other words, is there something in this waveform at this stage when everything sort of looks stable, but we know it's about to fail? Is there anything here that can give us clues about impending deterioration? And so in the same way that a piece of engineering will firstly fail in very subtle ways before it eventually crashes, the same can be said for the human body. There is no clinical situation where we go from being completely healthy to suddenly being very ill, with the exception of an acute traumatic event. In all other systems, we'll get early failure of control systems, but these may not be detectable until we get a big change, and that's when we're typically diagnosing patients. But by that stage, we've already effectively crashed. We're already on the route to failure, and we're much harder to treat. So thinking about crashing, and this is an area that I've worked in for a number of years, as I'm sure you're all aware, sepsis is a global health problem. And the key thing that we need is an earlier way of detecting deterioration. Our method is not a sepsis diagnosis per se, but it hopefully can tell you that a system is starting to fail. And so this ability, if a patient goes into A&E, which with what looks like the flu, we need to be able to decide whether they need to be admitted or whether they can be sent home. So this is just trying to illustrate that issue of where the blood pressure that we measure close to the heart can sometimes be um, deceiving. These are three mice um, and three mouse blood pressures, and these are the averages that the machine would give us of the blood pressure trace. Now, some of these mice are septic and some of them aren't. And looking at the blood pressure trace, I would guess that mouse two is septic because it has a low blood pressure and a high heart rate, which is consistent with sepsis. Mouse one and mouse three look to be within the normal range. Now, this is a measurement taken close to the heart in a large blood vessel in the macro circulation. If we look in the same animals at the gut, which is one of the first systems to fail, we can start to get a, a different picture of what's going on. Now, for the first animal, he looked perfectly healthy and actually has a very good blood supply to the gut. So I was correct in thinking that that was a healthy animal. The second animal looked septic based on its blood pressure and has a very compromised circulation in the gut. And so I was correct here as well that this animal is septic in the early stages of sepsis. The third animal looked normal when we took blood pressure readings, but actually has a very compromised circulatory flow in the gut. And this is where um, we might be missing something because this is being buffered by other control systems. And so we're missing the fact that this animal is actually very sick. And so is there information in the waveform that predicts clinical deterioration above and beyond these simplistic measures? Now, if you look at those top and bottom waveforms in detail, I hope you can see that the bottom one is much more uniform than the top one. And this is a theme that I'm going to build on during this talk about variability of the waveform shape. So, of course, we can measure the, and quantify the shape of the waveform. If we were to expand that waveform trace, we could measure all sorts of contours and gradients. The problem is we tend to look at data over much longer periods of time, both in the clinical setting and preclinically. And so this can become very complicated to do. For those of you who are less familiar with the pulse waveform, I'm showing it here on the left. The upstroke is dependent on what the left ventricle is doing, but the top of this is a mixture of blood coming out of the heart, a forward pressure wave, and what's coming back from the blood vessels, a reflected pressure wave. Um, and then after this point on the downstroke, we've got various notches and contours and reflected waves that tell us about what the blood vessels are doing. So there's important information about how well the heart is working and how stiff or floppy the arteries and blood vessels are. And so as Anthony mentioned, um, the NC3R gives, uh, gave an opportunity for biologists to present a problem to mathematicians to see if they could solve it. And so I took some of the radio telemetry data from our lab and gave it to a group of mathematicians who applied different mathematical um, theorems and approaches to looking at that data. And Philip Aston's uh, method is the one that I'm going to talk about, and this is the one that we've been developing for the last few years. So this is the main part of the talk. Um, I'm going to show you some exemplars of the method later, but if you can understand the method, then hopefully you'll be able to understand um, potential relevance in, in different settings. So the first thing is about this issue of language, which Anthony talked about, and the way in which different people think. So the way a mathematician looks at data is often fundamentally different from the way a biologist looks at data. Here we have three time series 
series data, and they could be three biological signals. And typically, as biologists, we would look at a variable over time, and we would try to take some meaningful numbers from this in order to draw a conclusion about what was happening. The problem with these three time series data are that they're very noisy and they're very chaotic, and it becomes difficult to um, explain what's going on or quantify what's going on. Mathematicians, on the other hand, look at the numbers that make up this data. They're not too bothered that it looks like a chaotic system necessarily. They want to understand what the numerical values are telling them. So the time axes on these are identical. And for every point in time, we have a numerical value in the top graph, the middle graph and the bottom graph. And this means that the data can be plotted in a different way, something that biologists wouldn't necessarily do, but mathematicians seemingly do all the time. So if you look at every point in time, you have a number here in the top, a number here in the middle, and a number here in the bottom. Three numbers means you can plot the data in three dimensions. And when you do that with this data, you end up with this, which is the Lorenz attractor. It's the same data, but it's plotted differently. It's trapped within a cube, and time is now represented going round. So you could look ad infinitum, and the data would always be within the cube. This now gives you something that you could quantify. So the key point is no numerical data has been thrown away. We're just viewing the data in a different format. So how do we do that with blood pressure data? Well, the problem with blood pressure data is we only have one data stream. So you've got uh, a single data stream. How can you plot that in 3D? Well, what Philip Aston, who's shown on the bottom here, did was he applied a method that had initially been developed by Floris Tackens um, in 1981. And what Floris Tekken said is you can take time delays and use those to um, uh, extract three numerical values from one signal. And I'm going to show you this on the next video. And the thing you need to remember is that we've got pressure on the y-axis, we've got time on the x-axis, and every single point on this wave has a numerical value associated with it because we have high fidelity recording. So this is my blood pressure data. We take a random point and we call it x and then two further points, y and z. And we can read those values off the pressure axis. These values are separated by a time delay, which is fixed. And that time delay is dependent on my heart rate. So if my heart rate is one second long or 60 beats per minute, the time delay will be a third of a second. So dependent on the length or the period of my beat, of my blood pressure wave, that will determine the time delay. So these three points, which are separated by a fixed time, are then plotted in three dimensions, x against y against z. And that gives us a single point in a cube. And then what happens is that those points move to the next numerical data point and the next one and the next one until it tracks through all of the data. Each time the three points complete one blood pressure wave, we get one loop in the cube. Just to show you that in more detail, here on the right are the numerical values that make up that waveform. We take our first three set of numbers, which are separated by a fixed time delay. That gives us a point in a cube. The data points then move to the next point, and that dot moves, the next point, and so on and so forth, until it tracks one entire beat, and we get a loop, and then we do 10 beats, and we get 10 loops. So then what we end up with is actually a mess because this contains all of the variability, all of the changes in my cardiac contraction, relaxation, changes in resistance and compliance, changes in response to respiration. Every beat is different. But what Philip noticed was that the majority of that noise appears to occur down one direction. And if you view that cube and just rotate it and look head on down one corner, what you end up doing is removing most of that noisiness and you've converted what looked like a ball of spaghetti into now a very neat, tidy triangle or a tractor, which you can quantify. So the key point here is no data has been thrown away. It's simply that the noisiest part of the signal is now going in and out of the screen, so you can't see it. What you're left with is the shape, something that tells you about the shape and the variability of the waveform. So the noisiest part of my signal arises as a result of changes in my absolute blood pressure or my baseline wander as my pressure goes up and down. This is factored out and what we're left with is the rest of the wave, the shape of the wave. So the take home message is 
every tiny change in the shape of this wave will be reflected as a bigger change on the shape of this triangle. So that's, this is what's happening. We're viewing a three-dimensional meshwork of data down one direction. And what that's effectively doing is converting that into a 2D image. So you're looking at it head on. The third dimension is going in and out of the screen and you're left with a two-dimensional image. So we've projected it into 2D, but we've not deleted anything. And then, of course, we're not just interested in a single moment in time. We're interested in what is happening over a long period of time. So this is my blood pressure, perhaps recorded over a few minutes. And this is showing how that changes over time. And we do that by adding density. Now, if I was a robot and every single one of my cardiovascular waves was identical to the next, then this would just appear as a single red overlapping triangle because every beat would be the same. But I'm not. I'm a biological being. So every single one of my beats is different. And where those points overlap, it's red. And where they don't overlap, it's blue. So to summarize, we are simply using an old signal that we that we know and love. And we're trying to extract new information from it by using all of the numerical values that make up the waveform. We take three points which are separated by a fixed time delay dependent on the duration of the beat. That then generates a point in a cube. We then uh, traverse an entire waveform and that generates a single loop in the box. We then generate 100 of those and that makes a mess. But when we look at it head on, the messiest bit goes in and out of the screen. And what we're left with is something that uniquely tells us about the shape and, uh, of the wave. And then we add density and that tells us about the variability of the wave. So when we've generated this image, we then need to make sense of it. So it's all well and good looking at it, but we need to actually get some quantifiable measures from it. And so you can see these by eye. It changes in size, the density spots move, it rotates, lots of different things happen to this image. And importantly, each of those changes correlates with a change on the wave, and that must correlate with a change um, in physiology. Some will be more important than others, and we're systematically trying to work that out. By eye, by human eye, you can see changes, but of course this method is ripe for machine learning and AI approaches because a computer will be much better at extracting feature changes from these types of signals. So how do we view um, this, this um, uh, invention? So this is effectively a, a decision support tool, or we, we, we believe it will be useful as a decision support tool. Because it's able to extract new information from the same signal, it's likely to enhance the sensitivity of detecting change. And clinically, that means that it could help with earlier diagnosis or treatment or management of patients. And preclinically, in drug development, for example, it could help us um, more sensitively identify risk or more um, sensitively identify efficacy of investigational new drugs. So the key point is we have a picture, we have an image, but we can quantify that image and link that to decision making. So there are some key differentiators of this technology um, and other algorithms, although there are many, many brilliant algorithms out there, but I just want to focus on, on ours. The first is that it's agnostic to the waveform, and I'll show you a slide um, exemplifying that in a moment. So it doesn't care what the waveform is. And as a result, because it doesn't care what the waveform is, it's not looking for individual features. It's not looking for a QRS complex. And we've shown that we can use fairly degraded signals um, and it can still work quite well. It also factors out baseline wonder. If you remember, by projecting onto 2D, the noisiest bit of the signal is the baseline wonder and we're factoring it out. So we're exclusively quantifying the shape and the variability of the waveform. And because it generates an image that can allow us both to visualize and quantify subtle waveform changes. And the key point is it is using every single piece of data, every single data point on that waveform, with the exception of non-physiological artifacts, which you should always remove. And therefore, it's resistance to bias introduction. We are not asking a doctor or a nurse to manipulate their data before they process it. And that's really important. So I'll just touch on the first of these. And that's just to show that the method doesn't care what the waveform is. And what I'm going to show you today is um, some exemplars in blood pressure, ECG, pulse oximetry, and respiratory waveforms. But as you can see, as long as the wave repeats or is almost periodic, then the attractor reconstruction method will work. 
So I'm going to show you a few examples just to show you a bit, potentially how this technology could be used. The first is to talk about clinical deteriorations. And because I happen to be interested in sepsis, I'll focus on sepsis, but it's not the only uh, clinical situation that this could be used in. The next one is to show some work um, from Jane Lyle, who's a PhD student in our group, who's looking at ECG um, and looking to uh, binary classifiers such as uh, male-female differences and also looking at drug effects. Um, I'll show you some data from Jenny Venton, which is looking at healthy aging and exercise. Again, just very light touch images. And finally, some applications in drug safety assessment, um, which is work from Esther bonnet luth and uh, Carolyn Lamb, who are in our group here. So our approach is to identify two different groups. So if you've got two different sets of data, um, one is healthy and one is disease, we want to see can we distinguish between them. The first thing we do is we analyze the data conventionally, so using the, the measures that we know and love, so systolic, diastolic pressure, pulse pressure, heart rate, ECG intervals, etc. And then we analyze exactly the same data by using the attractor method, so looking at the morphology and the variability of the wave. And then we ask the question, does the attractor method actually improve anything? Does it enhance the sensitivity of detecting the differences between the two groups? So this is an example of a sepsis experiment. We might do some radio telemetry on mice and we sample that at 1000 Hertz. On day one, we look in the naive state and say we look at sort of mid morning until early afternoon. And then the next day we make the animal septic and again, we track them. Now we're really interested in the early hours of sepsis because after about four or five hours, it's fairly obvious if an animal is septic. But we want to see if we, could, if we could have predicted it earlier. So when the animal looks otherwise stable, are we able to see some sort of changes in the waveform that tell us that it's about to get ill? So as I said, we use our conventional software to extract the traditional measures. And then we use our methodology to extract measures that relate to the shape and the variability of the waveform. And this is just to show you a sort of close up image of the types of things we're looking at. Here we have a single animal in the baseline state on the top and post sepsis on the bottom. And if you look carefully at the wave when it's expanded and when I'm drawing your attention to it, you'll hopefully see that the heart rate is about the same. The maximum and minimum and pulse pressures are roughly the same. But if you look at the shape of the wave, the top one goes up straight and then it's a bit pointy and then it comes down straight whereas the bottom one goes up and then it curves a bit and then it curves downwards. So these are reflective of resistance and compliance changes and changes in the force of cardiac contraction. You can see it when it's expanded in this way, but that would be very difficult to see on a live trace. But when you look at the corresponding attractor, you can see that the corresponding attractor rotates clockwise and it's about a 20 degree rotation so that is now something you can quantify which is describing this otherwise qualitative change this next table has a lot of data on it so um, apologies for that but i did want to put some data in but i'll summarize this all in a picture on the next slide so this is just showing you the comparison of conventional measures attractor measures when we're comparing a naive animal to a septic animal We've used receiver operating characteristics. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this statistical method, all you need to know is if the value is close to one, it means that the measure is a good discriminator between healthy and septic. If the measure is close to 0.5, it means it's a poor discriminator. So if we look at our conventional data, you can see that systolic pressure and mean arterial pressure are actually not very good discriminators between an animal in early sepsis and an animal that is healthy. In other words, we wouldn't necessarily be able to tell using these measures that an animal might be sick. Diastolic pressure performs a little bit better and heart rate is a really good um, index of change. So in the first six hours, your heart rate definitely goes up. The problem with heart rate is that heart rate can go up for lots of reasons, not just because of an infection. So although it's a useful, um, sensitive and specific biomarker in the case of sepsis, it also changes in lots of diseases. So let's look at the attractor results and see if that can give us more clues whether these animals are ill in early sepsis. So now you can see, firstly, we've got many, many measures of the attractor, which tell us about morphology and variability of the wave. And I've highlighted in orange the best performers. So you can see we've now got six really good performers, which are allowing us to distinguish between septic and, non and naive animals. And our best performer here is number three. 
We also can measure heart rate and you can see that our heart rate matches with the conventional heart rate. So by combining the best performers here with the best performers here, you should be able to increase the sensitivity and specificity of distinguishing between a septic animal in the earliest stages versus a healthy animal. Showing you all of that in pictures now, because that's much easier to understand. We've got blood pressure here from a healthy animal. Then one hour after sepsis doesn't look much different. Then four hours, it's starting to look different. And then 12 hours, it's really different. In this particular experiment, we would have diagnosed that the animal had sepsis around five hours using our conventional readouts. But when you use the attractor method, you can see that the animal is very diffuse um, on the healthy animal but immediately after sepsis, it's punctate. We get these hot spots and the arms get very narrow within one hour after sepsis. So in this experiment, we could have brought that diagnosis earlier. And in a clinical context, that can be a really important finding because it could um, improve the chances of a patient surviving. Just to show you the waveforms. So this is the waveform at four o'clock the day before at the top. And this is the waveform four o'clock after we've induced sepsis, so six hours after sepsis. And overall, the waves don't look that different if you're used to looking at blood pressure waves. But again, I hope you'll see that the uniformity of this one is much more uniform than the one here. And it's that which we think we're picking up. So, of course, that's in mouse data. I haven't actually done any animal experiments for the last five years because I've moved completely to data sciences. So um, NC3R have done their, their job with reduction as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'm moving into now clinical data um, sets. And we're, we're very lucky to be partnered with St. Thomas's Hospital. And Jennifer Venton and um, uh, Pete Charlton have, have been uh, generated this database. And Jenny is analyzing that currently to see if we can predict deteriorations earlier um, than the clinical notes suggest. So I'm going to move quickly on to some other exemplars um, just to show you the utility of the method in other waveforms. So this is um, Jane Lyle's data, who is a PhD student within the group, and she's interested in ECG intervals. And she wanted to know, are ECG attractors better or more sensitive at discriminating between two groups compared to ECG intervals? Jane developed some machine learning and plugged in some interval measures, and that became our, our, the sort of standard um, way of assessing um, differences between two groups. And then she also developed machine learning for the attractor features. And she used a binary classifier of male versus female, and she used very clean physionet data. So this is a typical female ECG and a typical male ECG. And after developing machine learning with ECG intervals, she, she put in some random male and female um, traces, and she was able to distinguish between male and female ECGs with about 74% accuracy. She used the same data, but with attractor reconstruction, and this time she was able to distinguish between them with 93% accuracy. So what this tells us is that the morphology of the ECG wave is giving us a bit more information about the differences between men and women compared to just the interval measures alone. She's also been looking at the effect of drugs um, and the effect of individual variation. And she's shown that within individuals, you can see here, this is baseline and placebo, individuals have very unique um, uh, attractor signatures for their ECG and that's well established that we have very unique ECGs but also you can see as you go across the rows that the effect of drugs has an impact on the attractor and we can quantify that very readily and so she's building on this data as we speak. Another few examples, just to show you some snapshots, we've been looking at the differences between younger and older people. So these are, these are all healthy individuals. But what we've seen is this pattern of younger people having um, more variability and wider attractors and older people having more narrow attractors. And we see that very often. So whilst these have no pathology, this is just an index of healthy aging. And it's very obvious when you look at the attractor and not as obvious when you look at the waveforms. Similarly, with exercise, Jenny's shown that you can see differences. So before and after high intensity exercise, the attractor appears to rotate. And again, we're trying to work out why that is. But it's very, very obvious um, looking at the attractor that there is some change in the cardiovascular system that is less apparent when you look at the waveform. And these two were using um, photoplethysmography, so PPG. Finally, I just want to show you a couple of examples of um, 
projects that we've been doing with industry partners um, in the area of drug safety and efficacy. This first project is a project um, that's being taken forward by Esther Bonnet Luth, who's a uh, postdoc mathematician in the group. Um, and this is a project sponsored by HESI, the Health and Environmental Sci Sciences Institute. HESI has a, a consortium of, of drug companies who are interested in looking at the effects of drugs on cardiac ionotropy. And they published a number of papers on this. And the team set us a challenge, which was to say, can we take their data and identify information about cardiac contractility, but not by using a catheter that's in the heart, but by using a catheter that is, that is in the blood vessel. So just to show you this on a picture, typically the gold standard way of working out if a drug is having an effect on the heart is to put a catheter inside the heart. From a three R's perspective, that's very invasive for the animal. It's technically challenging, it's costly, and it's time consuming. Another standard measure that's taken is from a peripheral blood vessel, and that's an arterial catheter that's much easier to do, much less invasive for the animal. And so they asked the question, can you get some signal using your attractor method about what's happening in the heart by using the peripheral arterial signal? And the short answer so far is, is yes. So if you look at this trace here, the green lines show the cardiac contractility as measured using a catheter that's placed directly in the heart. And the blue line shows one of the attractor measures that seems to correlate with the green measure, so the cardiac contractility, but this is entirely extracted from a peripheral um, catheter. So again, that represents both a refinement for the animal, but also allows um, the sci industry scientists to get clues about whether a drug is having an adverse effect in a much quicker way. So we, we're building on this now and looking at different drugs and different companies, but our pilot study suggests that there is certainly a correlation. Finally, this is a really nice project that we um, started this summer, um, and it was uh, with Mary McElroy and Aileen Mill and Carolyn Lamb from Charles River. And this was looking at um, uh, respiratory signals, and we hadn't previously looked at respiratory signals before, and they gave us some of their data from um, head out plethysmography and whole body plethysmography. And what you can see here are representative images of N of 8. On the left, we have our vehicle treated animal. So these are normal respiratory attractors from a healthy animal treated with saline. In the middle, you have a respiratory attractor from an animal with fibrosis treated with bleomycin. And on the right, you have an attractor from an animal that's been treated with bleomycin, but also an antifibrotic agent. So I hope you can see that the first one and the last one are starting to look similar. The group did find things like respiratory rate changes in the respiratory waveforms, but what the attractor is allowing us to do is more work out more sort of nuanced changes in the respiratory waveform in response to disease and drug. So rather than just looking at simplistic measures such as rate, we can look at that waveform in a completely different way and start to describe how the entire respiratory mechanics are changing by using the attractor method. So that was a really exciting finding. Again, three R's benefits because it could mean quicker experiments. You could take the animals down at more humane endpoints. Um, and again, commercial benefits because you could get more information from the same signal. So I'll just summarize here, and again, uh, uh, going back to what Anthony said, there's a lot of data out there, and we need to look at it in sensible ways. Um, and I think the, the project with Philip Aston has shown that by combining forces with, with different disciplines, particularly mathematics and biology, we can potentially achieve that. So typically data is sampled around 100 to 1,000 hertz, but most of us ignore that, and we take these simplistic measures. It's periodic data, so the method only works on data that is uh, approximately periodic, so waveforms that repeat. The attractor reconstruction method allows you to focus solely on the waveform shape and variability, and it allows you to quantify those rather than just do it qualitatively, which is currently done clinically. And what I've shown you, hopefully, in a number of examples is that this can enhance the sensitivity of detecting cardiovascular changes. I hope you can also see that there are numerous potential applications in the healthcare and biomedical research setting. Um, and finally, this whole method um, is appropriate for machine learning and AI approaches. There are lots of huge, big data sets out there currently, particularly human data sets. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to look at retrospective data sets in order to validate our technology. 
So it just remains for me to thank um, people past and present who've been working on there. We've got uh, Jane Lyle, Esther, um, Jenny is down here, Philip Aston, Carolyn Lamb. So these are the people whose data I showed you. These are a mixture of um, mathematicians. We've got pharmacologists who've generated data. We've got statisticians. We've got medics. So lots of people coming together, either providing data or analyzing that data and developing coding. So it's a, a really great interdisciplinary team. And I'll end there by just thanking, firstly, the NC3R for, for setting up the, the meeting that led to this project in the first place, um, funders past and present, um, and also I'm just uh, direct you to some of our papers and our website and my email. Um, and this top um, video just shows the system in action. So you've got blood pressure in the top row, and then you have your window of data from which you generate your attractor, and then you've got the measures of the attractors here, and those are the things that we quantify. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, so thank you very much to both of our speakers uh, and a very enlightening discussion on how math can be used to speed up disease detection. So if anyone had any questions, please do type into uh, the box in, in the side of your screen. Uh, currently I have one question. Uh, so this is from um, Andy Law, and it's you split the waveform into three, which obviously generates a 3D plot. Is there a biological rationale in that choice? Does the model work better, worse, the same with higher dimensions? I realize that it would be hard, make it harder to visualize. Good question, and we have tried it, and we are doing it, particularly with ECG. So we have gone into higher dimensions, and you're absolutely right, making sense of what that means becomes complicated. So three dimensions is something we can understand, two dimensions is something we can understand, but Jane is particularly looking at higher dimensions for the ECG to see if we can extract more information. So it was it was really trying to keep life easy and that's already given us some important information, but it's a very good question and, and we're testing higher dimensions as we speak. Do we have any other questions? I'll just say, if you do have more questions, um, please note down uh, Manashi's email address. Otherwise, you can email into the BIA, and we're happy to forward on any questions. So I think for now, that's all. So um, just to say a couple of words from us. Uh, we're the BIA, the Trade Association for Innovative Life Sciences in the UK. So if you're not a member and you're interested in joining, please do get in contact or go to our web website for more information. Uh, a few events coming up in the near future. We have our Entrepreneurs Program Pulse. Uh, we have some networking drinks for this on the 19th of March if you want to come along and support our up and coming entrepreneurs from the Crick and around the country. We also have a London Regional Breakfast networking event on the 11th of April, uh, which uh, we will carry on, I guess, in a similar vein of this. We're discussing AI in drug discovery. Um, and so please do go to our website, www bioindustry.org to register and find out about more of our events. And as I said before, this webinar will go up on the BIA YouTube channel from next week and we'll email you the link early next week. So please feel free to forward the link on to colleagues. And thank you very much to our speakers again and everyone who joined the webinar and have a good afternoon and weekend. <laughs>